Good morning. I am thrilled to be here and see so many faces that I recognize as uh, graduates in our HR program, instructors in our program, partners, uh, advisors, and new faces, so welcome. Again, my name is Angela Jante, and I'm the director of the Education and Business Programs, of which houses the HR program, HRBP program, and instructional design program. So um, I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Kevin Groves. He is an associate professor of management at Pepperdine University's School of Business and Management, as well as president of Groves Consulting Group, which helps organizations develop leadership talent through executive assessment, development, and succession planning systems. He also teaches in our corporate education department and in the learning consortium here at the Division of Continuing Education. I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Groves. Wonderful. Let's get out to our friend Tom. Thank you. So I'm going to immediately uh, violate a norm here and grab the microphone. Can everyone hear me okay? I don't do so well standing behind podiums, so. Uh, First of all, good morning. It's uh, fantastic to be here. Uh, wonderful to see all of you on a, a beautiful Friday. Uh, many thanks to Lindsay and her team and the entire uh, Community Education Division for being a part of, for sponsoring and being a part of this, uh, this fantastic event. Uh, really thrilled to be here. Uh, a lot of faces in the room. Uh, um, I know ma uh, many of you, surprisingly. I uh, look forward to meeting those who I know as well as our, our panelists uh, a little bit later this morning. Um, I wanted to, uh, to start things off by just uh, one acknowledging, um, maybe in a, a follow-up to Tony's remarks, uh, how important the, the work that you all do uh, in the HR human capital space, uh, such an important uh, part of all organizations, uh, our economies, the regions that we're a part of, uh, and the work that you do, I, I frankly, doesn't get uh, enough acknowledgement, so I think it's really, a, um, in my view, an important uh, starting point today. Uh, I did want to uh, uh, do a little bit of introductions just by way of uh, giving you a sense of my background, uh, I'm thrilled to wear and really blessed to wear two hats. Uh, I have the opportunity to, to work as a part of a consulting group, uh, work with organizations across industries around largely talent development, do a fair amount of uh, 360 degree assessment, succession planning work, internal leadership academy, executive team development, which um, those of you who know anything about the Grazie Deal School, uh, it values uh, applied research, really values faculty being a part of, of industry, and that's something I, I attracted me to the school, and I've been really, uh, really blessed to be, be a part of it. Um, uh, my uh, academic hat, uh, associate professor at the business school since 2008. We have a few waves in the room, a few uh, alum, alum now, right? nice to see you. Yeah, number. Okay. Uh, I teach primarily at our Malibu and West LA campuses. Uh, I do make it down to Irvine on occasion. It's always a, a beautiful trip down the 405. Never, never any traffic. You hear a bit of breeze, uh, but it is uh, it is a pleasure. Um, and uh, again, wearing these two hats uh, largely influences uh, the you know, same issue that it, it, same topics that are of interest to me. And that's largely leadership development, succession. Um, how well we're preparing the future workforce, given all the you know, fairly troubling drivers that are, are working against us in, in many ways. And um, I do a, a fair amount of public speaking, uh, events like these, but uh, usually not with the number of subject matter experts in the room. So the fact that we have learning, development, HR professionals, um, I look forward to, frankly, learning from you and hearing about some of the challenges that you're, you're up against. So, um, so here we go. Uh, I'm on a, a pretty tight clock here, so I want to be, be careful. I've got my, uh, my timer, and I know uh, our staff will keep us uh, keep me honest. Okay, presentation preview. I want to start with uh, some, some misnomers, some misunderstandings, some possibly um, some resistance. I suspect many of you have heard in the room as you've tried to make the case for why succession planning is an important investment of time, resources, energy, and just attention, management team attention, board, and otherwise. That's something that um, I found is Almost always that kind of, uh, you don't make the case clearly, uh, all else fails. I want to start there, I think it's an important conversation. Um, Intensifying business case, I want to share a little bit about what these drivers are. Why, why might succession planning be not just important, but really vital for the work that you do, right? Uh, irrespective of where you sit in your organizations. Um, I do want to share a little bit about where, where the research and data and findings come from that, that I've been a part of, and again, I'll kind of toggle a little bit back and forth between you know, more traditional academic um, studies, field studies, and client engagements, and how they, they inform largely the same issues. And then um, uh, most of the content for today's session is going to be around uh, what I've described or what I've 
built essentially around succession management capabilities. It's basically a best practices model that's been validated uh, that gives us some idea of what does great succession planning look like, how do you build that into the capabilities of an organization, and then what outcome does it predict, um, which is almost always the case, right? If we're gonna invest in, in these, uh, these systems, uh, what's the yield? Um, and I do wanna leave you with uh, some fairly specific recommendations that uh, I'd love for you to take back your organizations to, to test or to provide feedback on how well they, they work, uh, but, but largely uh, it, it give you a chance to perhaps uh, diagnose, further assess, and improve um, some of your own work around succession. So uh, that's the direction we're going. I hope, uh, hope you're ready. I'm gonna give you a list here, and I want, I want you to uh, give me some feedback uh, uh, with respect to how many of these misnomers, these misunderstandings, uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, just complete uh, errors in, uh, in judgment that you've heard uh, in your, uh, your career, either in the HR space or otherwise. Um, executive succession, not important now, that's really just the CEO position. Right? Why, uh, why would we invest time and energy? Isn't that just the board's responsibility uh, for the CEO? Um, this is really just about family businesses, right? Succession, that, isn't that something only uh, family businesses have to engage in? It's not, not particularly important. Um, CEOs, ultimately responsible for identifying their successors. At the end of the day, he or she knows best the scope and complexity of the role. Um, why would we build in a formal process, a system, a set of practices? Um, we don't want to spook the market, and so the last thing a CEO wants to do is, in any way, acknowledge he or she might be leaving. And so it's a, it's a way to, if you build a succession planning process, you're actually signaling an exit, and that can be big troubling, especially in a, in a public space, public traded companies. Um, succession management simply adds to the cost of doing business. Um, and not just the cost, but uh, the expected returns. When it comes to an uh, ROI kind of calculation, this is really you know, a costly effort. So success, this is, uh, this is why I know we'll hit close to home for a lot of folks. Succession plan is owned by HR, right? That's a human capital HR system or practice. Uh, that's not something that business owners, operators, really have to concern themselves with. In other words, that's, that's, that's something you need to build. And then uh, probably most troubling, and I'll share a few examples, succession planning is really something that's episodic. It is not a ongoing process that you have to invest in. Um, how many of these, uh, first of all, does this match your reality? Have you, have you heard this from boards, from executive team members, from business owners, those of you who are in a consulting space from clients and otherwise? Which of these have you found to be most, uh, most common or most, uh, most uh, troubling that sometimes shuts the conversation off? What do you think? Okay, yes? Succession planning is owned by you. Okay. <laughs> HR, yeah, so it's, that, that's the functional, okay, yeah. Uh, runs, runs uh, can, can make it from that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think one of the ones I've heard most uh, that maybe is not quite on there or sort of, sort of integrated into it is that it's going to happen anyway. No, we've got good people, we've got good talent, it's going to naturally occur. Okay. Yeah, it'll, it'll work itself out? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Others? Laura? Uh, it's a discrete event. Not that they say that, but that's the way they yeah, this is something we, uh, we anticipated over the next six months, and we execute, we can go back to business. Right? Um, this, is, this is really troubling for, for a number of reasons. I'll, I'll provide, and thank you for those uh, willing to, to jump in here. You can see why I sometimes exceed, uh, exceed my time. Um, the, the, the reality, the, the data, what we know about how, how challenging uh, this process is, um, doesn't mirror the sense of urgency we typically see from industries, uh, from many organizations. And I, uh, I want to acknowledge those, those of you who are part of organizations that are already doing this well, um, that's fantastic. So here are a few data points to consider. Um, Fortune 500 firms, uh, just over half, 54%, are actively developing CEO successors. So these are the largest, most well-resourced, from a scale perspective, really have the most levers to pull on to actually do formal succession planning. Just half of the largest firms. And if you can imagine, the larger we go, the uh, smaller uh, firm we get, less, uh, get less utility. Uh, Fortune 500 firms, uh, just 40% uh, report that they are without a single internal CEO candidate, meaning they, don't, they have not identified a single person that they are actively grooming. Uh, really striking. Um, this is a, a big number I'll, I'll break out in a little bit here. Roughly 112 billion 
in mar lost market value for unplanned forced CEO exits. Uh, if you look at it, and uh, obviously from a publicly traded space, but what happens when you do have these surprise turnover? And I'll, I'll share a few remarks about how the Me Too movement has really, in many ways, punctuated what, what many of us have already known, uh, that this is kind of a, a time bomb waiting to happen. We know we're not prepared when we have these unplanned exits. How much is that really debilitating? So a lot of data here. Uh, failure rates of external hires, much higher than we like to acknowledge. And uh, I do a fair amount of work with executive search firms, and of course, you know, they're in the business of, of trying to find the right talent for the right uh, moment in time. But from a data perspective, longitudinally, we know internal promotions over time have a, a far better retention, performance, in many ways, the kind of st strategic agenda of the firm becomes a lot more uh, uh, robust. And then finally, um, labor market pressures. Right? We know there's this mass movement of the workforce that is exiting uh, and replacing them is you know, a set of, of, of talent, a part of the labor market that sees things differently, a different set of values, and that requires a lot of transition. So we see this, this flux. So this suggests that the urgency should be much higher. So here, uh, let me give you a, a, a few recent examples. Um, what do you notice about a uh, fairly high profile, last five to 10 years or so, CEO successions uh, Apple, Kaiser, who I'll speak to in a little bit here, IBM, versus the firms in the bottom, uh, HP, Uber, and Samsung. Uh, in the news recently, all went through fairly, very high profile, in many ways, in some cases, scandalous uh, CEO successions. Uh, what do you notice the difference between those two uh, sets of firms, above the line and below? Apple's probably one that yeah, got the most attention. And pretty smooth transition, right? Tim Cook, um, relatively unplanned, although some would say you know, there was a sense of what was happening at Apple for some time. And Kaiser, right, in, in the moment of a fairly tumultuous period that continues in the industry. And IBM, right, very robust internal uh, processes. Uh, the market certainly wasn't, um, in many ways, uh, gained confidence in those firms' abilities to continue despite the transition. And then we got uh, the folks in the bottom, not picking on these firms just by way of illustration. Uh, Hewlett Packard, right? They cycled through a number of CEOs, started with her, gone through a number. They're still not sure who they are and what they're doing, right? Uber um, seems to be getting back on track, but is still working through that issue. Um, and then Samsung, of course, uh, a number of dynamics there, but certainly suggests a, a lack of a really a robust succession process. So, uh, the point of, of illustrating this is these are the high profile, right, very public examples of when succession goes well. Um, if you dig beneath the surface, we see you know, the discipline and the functionality of how you approach succession really differs with these, um, these sets of firms. Uh, so here, let's, uh, let's get into a little bit of data and then we'll get to the, the capabilities. Uh, so $112 billion CEO succession problem. Um, here are a few data points to consider. Um, this is from you know, industry research, and, and by the way, happy to share any and all these uh, slides and supporting uh, materials if that's of interest. But um, lack of succession management, uh, most firms don't do this particularly well, uh, meaning uh, a robust, formalized succession planning process. Um, uh, just 50% of boards report being very confident in their organization's approach to succession, and that's not just the CEO, but the executive team throughout the organization. Labor market changes are really significant. I and mean, just think about that. 75% of the workforce in 2030 will be millennials, um, most of whom are not quite uh, at that kind of seat, uh, executive level, right, VP level and above. That suggests this massive movement, lots of transitions, and that performance differential is, uh, is very meaningful, uh, this commitment to, to internal talent. So suggest uh, uh, forced or unplanned exits are really costly. Uh, finally, the Me Too movement. Unexpected exits and um, you know very serious uh, issues, of course, with respect to sexual harassment and other other uh, problematic, to say the least, workplace behavior. But it shines a light on how prepared are you. And um, Nike is, is an organization that um, certainly has had a mostly positive reputation in terms of employee engagement, of talent and development, um, perhaps outside of maybe some of the. Uh, low-cost manufacturing partnerships, but for the most part, it's had a good reputation. Um, anyone familiar with the specifics of the, the Nike story and Me Too movement? Anyone remember or is following that? 
It's a fascinating story. A large group of women at Nike got together and said, boy, we're not, uh, we don't seem to be uh, operating as we should as colleagues. Let's conduct a covert survey on how we treat one another, how we engage with each other in the organization. Uh, survey results were shared to the CEO. CEO saw it and said, boy, we've got a real issue here. Uh, they've lost uh, 10, and the count might be more, depending on the day, lost 10 top executives uh, as a result of essentially uh, a damaging workplace culture around uh, gender differences, around issues of harassment, kind of a machismo, you know, male culture. I'm not picking on Nike just by way of illustration. Ten. Ten executives, uh, one of whom was the successor to the CEO. Um, so it's, a, it's an example of you know, how well are they designed or how well they set up to handle plan, unplanned forced exits. And we'll see. We'll see how, how, this, uh, how this goes. Okay. Uh, so here we go, talent management uh, uh, practices across industries. How well are organizations prepared for this? Um, this is an influential uh, study that I find is really helpful to get a sense of when it comes to various industries, uh, in specific you know, uh, business segments, um, who's prepared? And we see, uh, this is the IBM Institute for uh, Business Value, Human Capital Institute. And we see most industries are doing uh, okay, making broad investments in talent management, uh, there are a number that are behind the curve. Um, this is for uh, broad talent management capabilities. Um, when you zero in on succession, that utilization rate around best practices drops precipitously. And I'll share a little bit about that in, in a moment. So the reason why I wanted to showcase healthcare is uh, I'm, I'm going to show uh, share with you uh, three cases, uh, three examples of organizations that are doing really well in an industry where the utilization rate of Succession best practice is very, very low. Uh, there, there are three um, healthcare organizations. So although we do a lot of work uh, across industries, healthcare is really fascinating to highlight given the, the depth of challenges that they're up against. Okay, how many folks in the room do we, do we have uh, uh, from the healthcare space? I had a chance to review the roster a little bit that are coming in, and then we have, uh, we have a few. Great, great, uh, great to be with you. Uh, you're such an important part of uh, the future of our Economy, our world, our family members, and otherwise. So, so why is why is it so tough in healthcare? Maybe the, the obvious question. I'll, I'll try to be uh, be brief here. You know, it's uh, 18, 19 percent of GDP. It's a big part of of our world. Doesn't matter where we sit. It's really an important uh, you know, part of the work that we do. Um, a number of drivers here. Uh, first, uh, it might be the obvious uh, change in the goalposts. Right? Uh, uh, hospitals and health systems are essentially now incentivized to meet uh, quality outcomes for reimbursement from the government rather than uh, volume. So you can imagine those goalposts are pretty significant. We're going to, our work, our business is based on not the volume of patients and services we provide, but the quality of services we deliver. And that change, that's a game changer, of course, for all you know, human capital uh, practices. Uh, 575 crisis and limited racial ethnic diversity. Um, you know, healthcare struggles, frankly, from having a diverse workforce, particularly in leadership roles. And uh, the issue of the 575, just think of you know, a lot of the clients that we work with, uh, not an uncommon to have 60, 70 percent of their executive team transitioning out in five years. Uh, so think VP level and above. Uh, and there's almost no way to develop quickly enough, you know, the internal talent to replace those roles. It's a real pressure point. I know for, uh, I recognize a few folks in the room in the healthcare context, that's a, that's a real, real pressure point, right? Uh, then finally, I'm thinking of the, just the, how prepared is, is healthcare? 75% of CEOs uh, anticipate retirement in the next five years. It's enormously costly to go through the transition to CEOs. Um, some estimates of a million and a half or more just from a single hospital. So, um, and that, that's likely very comparable to the organizations that you're a part of. I mean, you go through that CEO transition, you know, it's, it's very, very costly. Not just a uh, you know, dollar cost, but you know, lack of movement on strategic planning, et cetera. So, um, part of the showcase here is really to, to highlight an organization, an industry that is uh, you know, really challenged and is, is frankly not, not made a lot of those upfront investments. Okay, um, so here we go. Succession management capabilities. I wanted to, sh to share just a little bit about where these best practices came from. Um, and I'm going to go through this uh, a model, essentially a, a, a list of capabilities or skills that we know predict good outcomes. I just want to share with you very briefly you know, where this research program came from. Again, um, having the benefit of wearing two hats, um, 
It's, it's been really fascinating to work both in more of a traditional academic setting where we're conducting field studies, we're doing qualitative reviews, we're doing you know, quantitative analysis of looking at government data and trying to validate tools, and then working with clients and organizations that are, that are in the, the midst, all of you essentially trying to, to tackle these issues. So it's been really important to navigate across both of those, uh, those models, uh, both, of, both of those worlds. So uh, phase one, I uh, developed this model uh, through a lot, mostly qualitative uh, work. Um, phase two was a lot of uh, benchmarking studies, um, um, most of which I, I detail in the book. And the current uh, phase of the, the project is largely working with, with organizations trying to operationalize and trying to you know, get, get the, uh, these, these practices out where they do most, uh, most benefit, which is, you know, frankly, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the front lines. So I'll share a few of those with you this morning. Okay, so here, here we go, success management capabilities. Uh, we basically have three sets of, of practices, of functional ways to build in this uh, priority around succession. And notice the, 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 the language here is really important. This is not for the CEO, this is not for just top management. This is a succession planning capability that permeates the organization. And for most organizations, it is CEO, executive team, uh, the model here assumes that really we should be identifying leaders earlier in their career in those frontline emergent leadership roles and having a, a logical process that allows us to capture data on potential performance that moves up to the organization. So that's, that's an operating assumption. And I know for many organizations, you know, all bets are off. We, we can't imagine pushing the process you know, that low in the, in the organization for any number of reasons. But that, that's an important, uh, important starting point, at least for uh, for this, this approach. So we have enabling capabilities, we've got assessment capabilities, and transition capabilities. So, um, and some of the, the language here is gonna feel quite, quite familiar to, to all of you, right? Being really smart about onboarding, thinking about engaging top leadership teams, thinking about assessments from a, a more rigorous perspective. So it's gonna uh, sound very familiar. I think that the difference is in uh, how you think of, of, of operationalizing and being very strategic and how these, uh, how these uh, work in practice, you know, thinking of uh, some of the execution issues. So uh, hopefully most of the conversation we have this morning uh, will be, will be on at that level and you know, look forward to the panel session to that end. Okay, so uh, top management team engagement. So here's, uh, here's what this looks like. Here's what the, the model assumes. Number one, um, strategic alignment. Um, thinking of much, clear, much clearly clearer about how talent management practices and capabilities are aligned with your business outcomes, specifically around the strategic plan and the range of strategic initiatives the executive team is, is trying to execute. Uh, and that can be very nuanced. For example, thinking about uh, strategic talent pools, which positions, which roles are pivotal to the strategic outcomes we're trying to execute. And I'll share a couple examples of that with, uh, with Kaiser in a moment. Uh, integration of the, these practices and, and operations, then mentoring, developing, and teaching you know, to what extent is the executive team fundamentally hands-on involved in that process? Is it a tacit, we like what you're doing, uh, continue HR, you're doing great work, uh, or it's a, I'm willing to sponsor projects, I'm willing to teach in, in internal programs, I'm willing to take on uh, protégés, mentees, and uh, when it comes to the, the talent review processes that we engage, I'm willing to devote several days a year to that process, not a kind of a, we'll send you the data you need, leave us alone uh, kind of, kind of uh, approach. And so I'll provide some examples of that in, uh, in a moment. Uh, broad uh, leadership development culture, another driver here, a uh, broad diverse view of talent. This is really important, this is philosophical, and I think has a lot of pressure on diversity outcomes, frankly. Where do good leaders come from? Are they just from finance and operations? So when we think of promotion to C-suite roles, that's largely where we go, because traditionally that's been the case. Or do we assume we need to have a, kind of a broader lens on where leadership talent comes from and make sure our systems and practices allow, um, frankly, uh, overlooked, non-traditional, unusual sources of, of leaders across cross functional units, across uh, service lines. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky one, because uh, frankly, uh, there's uh, mixed, mixed views on, in practice. When you look at organizations and how they execute, you can uh, pretty, pretty well tell where they sit on that issue. Transparency and fairness. Do you even know that you've been identified as someone with a lot of potential 
And uh, to what extent is that process seen as fair, as equitable, as even codified? Is that my direct manager and his colleagues or her colleagues sat around a table and had a conversation about potential? Or is that a rigorous process? Do I know what the dimensions are? How is that routed to, how is that, how does that tell a story about my personal development, whether I'm high potential or not? We'll get into some of those other details momentarily. And finally, uh, uh, releasing talent for development, another really tricky one. In part because it cuts across a, a sense of, you know, am I, am, I, am I willing to take one for the team by releasing some of my best other roles and it uh, puts some pressure on, on my own, my own unit's performance in the short term. So this is really an enterprise-wide view on, you know, I, feel, I feel like I'm, uh, as a, uh, we want to commit to the broader cause, which means releasing some of our best and brightest elsewhere in the organization. Okay, finally, talent management RI and uh, metric success management core, uh, scorecard, uh, board engagement and communication strategy. Um, this is uh, really important, frankly, to make the business case for boards, for the HR committee of the board, and for the executive team. And you know, a scorecard in the sense it's very targeted around succession outcomes. Things like diversity outcomes and roles, how diverse is the pipeline. Uh, I'll speak to a few in a moment here, internal, external hiring ratio, We'll talk about leadership bench strength. Uh, but the important point is that it's codified, it's communicated to the executive team. There's a sense of mutual accountability. This isn't just HR reporting what is. It is a, you know, we're, we're a part of this conversation together and that, that creates a really important accountability. Uh, so here's an example. Here's, a, here's one case. And again, the book goes through a number of cases, but in this, uh, this instance, I wanted to you know, give you a snapshot of what this looks like. So, um, Kaiser Permanente, how many, uh, how many Kaiser members do we have uh, having the room? I suspect uh, quite, a, quite a few. Oh, just uh, interesting, fewer, fewer than I thought. All right, uh, well, I mean, uh, better, better or worse. Uh, Kaiser, uh, enormously successful uh, health system. That's probably a reasonable conclusion to reach from just, just uh, objectively. Uh, very large, very well positioned, frankly, for the Affordable Care Act and what that demands of, of providers. Um, here are a few uh, uh, metrics. Uh, what I want to share with you is their uh, strategic leadership program, their SLP program. It's a it's a, a beautiful, very I think uh, um, clear example of what top management team engagement and strategic alignment looks like with with pipeline development. In this case, a program targeted for directors, newly placed VPs, and other mid mid level managers who are about to make that leap. So here's a, a few data points. Um, Large organizations, 220 uh, uh, FTEs, roughly, and about a about a 60 uh, billion or so dollar business. So uh, SLP program again it is intended to say, all right, if you're a director, newly placed VP, uh, mid-level manager sitting across any of our regions, and you're trying to understand how does my work tie into the national strategy of the organization? How do I how do I ensure that alignment? If I'm in uh, revenue cycle management. I'm a, a physician leader, I'm a nurse leader, how do I make that transition? Programs intended to ensure strategic thinking, strategic insight, you know, thinking about the enterprise wide uh, uh, as a whole, and a deeper understanding of the actual strategy. And if you don't think about Kaiser, uh, that strategy includes affordability, includes the integration of technology and convenience for members. Uh, it certainly includes a lot around access, improving access to care. Uh, so uh, there's a sense of how you know, no matter where you sit in the organization, how does that, how does that align with your, uh, with your work? And so here's how they do it. Uh, three, a three-part program, three-phase. And so I know for, for many uh, of the folks in the room, you likely have internal development programs of one degree or another for high potentials for leaders. Here's where I think this makes a big difference. Um, one, uh, this preparation phase, they essentially build in a sense of, you know, what project might you conceive of as a, as a director, as a, a newly placed VP, um, that could, that could uh, make a stronger contribution in sense of alignment with our national business strategy or as an organization. So this first phase is essentially uh, brainstorming with their direct manager, with executive sponsors around, uh, around this issue of alignment of your work, a very specific project. Uh, second phase is residential. They spend uh, three days uh, essentially going through a seminar where they're steeped in what is our strategy? How does that differ from other providers? What's changing in the marketplace? How, how might my project move the needle or in some way be, be aligned? This is a, as an offsite, again, somewhat traditional uh, in terms of some of the, the learning that takes place here. Then finally, um, uh, later in the project, uh, it's actually the project phase, 
They have to deliver at graduation, essentially, preliminary results on their projects. And one, one quick example would be a pharmacy manager who's looking to reduce costs of, of the of delivery, basically the operating cost of the business unit. Uh, and in her case, she was able to show a reduction based on some lean-like like principles where she could uh, you know, uh, demonstrate some, some results. So the important part of this program is, uh, and we'll get to the, the, the drivers here, is number one, not an HR initiative, right? This was uh, not only uh, co-designed and delivered with the executive team, uh, this is the, the top top executive team. So uh, a few folks that are involved here, um, Paul Swenson is the Chief Diversity Officer, and Dr. Ronald Copeland is their SVP and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. He's also uh, an orthopedist. Uh, really important uh, role, you know, they're uh, co-designers, so they're essentially in the kind of whole position with the support of their uh, HRAB team, and then uh, a number of their other top uh, top executives play a really active role. Again, not passive, not, you know, they, they attend the program, but they play a role in teaching and mentoring and sponsoring projects. And these, these are folks that are sitting in, in Oakland, right there on their headquarters. Participants in the program could be anywhere, you know, across Kaiser's region. So really important. Here are a few data points you might find interesting. Um, and from a scorecard perspective, what kind of results do they get? Uh, leader turnover, uh, one of many things they track, and they compare, uh, this is uh, part of the work that I did with them, to say, you know, what's the rigor of the program when it comes to comparing those who went through the program versus those who are already identified as high potential, you know, throughout the Kaiser network that may not be able to participate in the program from an issue of availability or otherwise. So we see uh, some really encouraging findings here over a, roughly a four-year period. Uh, you see in blue here, these are uh, just the, the hypos, so those, those individuals who were rated as having great potential for executive role but did not go through the program. We have the, in the orange, the SLP program only. So these are folks who went through the program but were not uh, rated hypo at that moment in time. And then we have those who were both. And so somewhat encouraging that you see the, the complementary nature of a robust potential assessment system and the benefit of uh, this, this program that comes to, uh, to turn over. So one of, one of many net metrics, but one that's important. So why does this work? Uh, emphasis on networking, really important in a large matrix, complex environment like Kaiser. Uh, Co-ownership, really, really critical. Uh, Co-ownership meaning the executive team, specifically uh, C-suite level leaders are, are, are in the ownership position. Um, Role-based, uh, strategically aligned role-based practices, really key. Uh, the issue of diversity, this is uh, built into the program. Diversity of background, diversity of functional role, gender, ethnic, and other diversity drivers as a way of saying, we want this cohort to reflect who we are as an organization. That's something that, that is built in over time. So important, uh, important part of the process for, uh, for Kaiser. Okay, uh, let's transition. Assessment, uh, second set of capabilities. And, and again, I'm, I'll, I'll provide a, a, a number of examples here from the healthcare space, but uh, I don't want to uh, uh, inadvertently send a message that this is somehow specific to that context. This is just, a, I think, an industry that's in transition is really interesting. Um, so a few drivers here, performance feedback, number one, you know, thinking about 360 degree feedback as not a, an administrative process, not something that's used for performance reviews, right? Uh, companies got into uh, uh, that hot water years ago, right? Trying to kind of somehow morph uh, multi-source 360 feedback into the administrative process and big surprise, becomes politicized, no one wants to participate. The data aren't very good. There's a sense of, uh, you know, kind of a competitive context. So in this case, the best practice is clearly around thinking of multi-source 360 feedback as a development tool on competencies that are tied to the strategic plan in a way that's intended for development. Really, really important distinction. Um, robust feedback across levels and a performance management platform. So, you know, a way to codify performance data in a, in a very meaningful way that can be used for, uh, for development planning. And I'll, I'll speak to a, a few of those examples. I know we have a number of, uh, of firms in the room that are using a number of these platforms, success factors and otherwise. Um, okay, here's a cornerstone capability that um, you probably um, would assume would be a part of the talk this morning. And that is the actual succession planning, talent review, talent profile. What does that process look like? And what are, what are some, uh, some practices that work? So, uh, a few uh, a few drivers here. I'll talk uh, quite a bit about rigorous talent reviews, and I, I found that the, the variability, the variance on the rigor and depth 
and the timing of talent reviews differs a lot across organizations. So there's, uh, and that's not to say that that the uh, that there's one best way, but there's clearly a set of drivers that I think really improves outcomes that I'll, I'll share, uh, share in a moment. Um, Valid assessment tools, I'll talk uh, quite a bit about that in a moment with uh, another case uh, uh, for, for discussion here. So um, Sutter Health is uh, another health system, but one that's uh, much smaller, significantly smaller than Kaiser, uh, just about 50,000 employees, so about a fourth of the size, roughly. Uh, 24 business units or, or hospitals, uh, as it relates. Uh, uh, Size-wise, and um, uh, just over 40 million in annual uh, annual income. So they're about about a 10 uh, 10 to 11 billion dollar uh, net patient revenue um, system. Okay, why look at uh, uh, Sutter Health? They have one of the most rigorous, most effective, at least from my perspective, um, annual succession planning talent review process. Um, just not just from a rigor perspective, but, but outcomes. Looking at the data they track, they, they really tell an incredible story, and they just went through a, a CEO succession method, which I think is quite, uh, uh, quite interesting. So they start the first level with the business unit. So in terms of pushing down that succession planning, talent review, hypo assessment process, you know, their floor uh, is essentially these, these hospital executive teams um, and their direct reports. So you, you can think of C-suite at the business unit level, uh, and, uh, and their, their teams. Um, uh, however, and, and this is part of the, the work that uh, we've done for them, is trying to think about how to push that lower in the organization. Uh, so direct reports to these business units, uh, emerging leaders, that's rolled up to the service area, essentially the region, uh, the region uh, over, overseeing these, uh, these business units, these hospitals. Uh, and then uh, finally that, that kind of culminates at the system or corporate level in, a, in kind of a logical way. So you can kind of see where this starts, you know, direct reports to the business unit all the way to the, uh, the C-suite. Um, so what distinguishes this, this process from others? A few things. One, uh, they use a, a validated uh, high potential assessment tool. Uh, really important. Uh, to hear nothing else from this part of the session, uh, I'll touch on this with uh, some of the recommendations. Uh, it's having a real clear sense that the level of error and rigor bias and judgments that happen when management teams sit around a table and try to decide who has high potential um, is, is very, very high risk. In fact, it incurs a lot of legal uh, exposure and risk when it comes to potential. Um, Sutter's really, uh, I think, wisely uses a, a formalized tool that's been uh, validated over time that actually predicts uh, success in roles. Really important part. Uh, development planning, leadership academy nominations, they devote several days a year to this annual talent review process. It's facilitated by HR, OD, process experts, but the actual content, uh, I should say the, the intensity of those conversations is, is quite rigorous over, over the course of the year. That's really, really important. It can't be uh, kind of sandwiched into a shorter shorter period. And probably most importantly, you know, these talent review conversation sessions are based as much on the outcomes you know, how do we rate folks, where do they sit, as it is on the, the developmental implications. What do we do for this person's development over time based on, based on the process? And I'll share a couple examples of that here. Um, so you probably recognize this uh, pretty traditional standard uh, nine box approach, right? Uh, it's a way to assess performance and role uh, and, and, and also include uh, issues of a rating and conclusion around potential. But what makes this different, at least from my perspective, is is again, a, it's not a process just to put people in, in uh, quadrants, right? But I've seen, we've had some clients that have uh, you know, 36 box uh, uh, tools. But in this case, you know, fairly straightforward, but the real difference is to think, depending on where you sit in this process, what are these specific developmental implications for that person? How do we communicate that in a fair, open, transparent way? How do we make them, make them known, make it known to them that we value their, their work? and a sense of calibration that takes place. So it's really important, again, I think particularly around the, the diversity and that broad view of leadership talent. So, uh, the more that team members and a group, a facilitated group, can calibrate both the performance and potential ratings becomes really important. And uh, again, to underscore the issue of potential from a, a validated tool is really, really important. So what are some of the outcomes that, uh, that Sutter Health uh, is able to uh, report or yield? And again, this is uh, part of the work that we did with them around, around metrics and analysis to say um, internal external hiring ratio, right? We're looking to procure talent internally. How well are we doing it over time? 
How diverse is that talent pool? Is it meeting our strategic needs? Here are a few data points. Um, you see their annual goal there, 70% uh, fairly traditional. We want uh, roughly seven out of 10 of our VP level and above roles to be sourced internally. Uh, and over a, a fairly significant period, and uh, this has certainly continued to date, uh, they're well over that, 71% uh, or higher of, of those roles. And this is during a period of growth, during a period of, uh, again, tumult in the, in the industry, so it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, I do some, uh, a lot of benchmarking. You know, our, our firm is a lot of benchmark, I should say, around uh, talent management succession. We see uh, for organizations in the healthcare space, 50% um, over time is, is about, about where that typically is. You see where, how much they're, uh, by comparison to their competitors, are doing. Uh, 70 some percent is really strong. And this one's really important. Uh, and uh, of all the metrics I found, this really tells the right story. Uh, bench strength. What percentage of critical leadership roles, not just executive roles, but critical leadership roles, this is where the alignment with the strategic plan is really important. Uh, what percentage of those roles has at least one right now, internal ready right now candidate? Yeah, that, that's the metric across the enterprise. We see healthcare, not surprisingly, is, is struggling. Uh, survey, uh, again, benchmarking work suggests 30% is about where a lot of organizations are, and Sutter is uh, uh, very quickly approaching 50%. Uh, so not great, but certainly better than, than most organizations, right? Saying across the enterprise, we're prepared for those unexpected transitions, the, the unexpected exit or otherwise. Okay, um, I'm gonna uh, transition here a little bit here just for sake of time. Um, CEO succession, the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, particularly when there is a high profile transition. So this was a fairly recent transition, uh, 2016, 2017 period. Uh, Pat Fry, their longtime CEO, was also an, an administrative intern, started his career in his late 20s at Sutter, he finally transitioned. And uh, Sarah Cremans, uh, who spent a number of years at Kaiser, uh, but had been with Sutter Health for about 10 years, uh, assumed uh, uh, his role. So very smooth process, did not have to go outside for talent. Um, she's well prepared, frankly, for a number of reasons, is doing, is doing quite, uh, quite well uh, in, in that space. So uh, it's a really important part of the, the outcomes here. Okay, last set uh, last of capabilities, and we'll get to some uh, recommendations uh, and get to our panel. Transition. Transition capabilities are really important, uh, assuming that you not only have a number of expected transitions and roles, but if the labor market uh, trends continue and you're smart, um, kind of wise enough to see, as, as I know all of you are, that there are going to be unexpected, uh, whether it's you know unfortunate Me Too movement kinds of shocks or just health or otherwise, there are going to be a number of these, these uh, unexpected transitions. And so what are those capabilities? New leader onboarding and role-based leadership development. So a couple of uh, practices here, and again, this is, uh, is a, you know, we're, we've worked with organizations in this space, there's a sense of, well, we do, we do onboarding, and that's fantastic. Um, when it comes to really understanding a, a given executive's transition, either internally into a new role, or one, particularly one who is sourced outside, the quality and depth of that onboarding experience is really where you move the needle on retention, on productivity, and in many ways engagement. And does, does the newly placed executive feel, feel at home, feel like this is this place they, they want to be? So a few things here. Um, one, thinking of, of, of onboarding very comprehensively, and that is if you in fact are promoted into a new leadership role or into any executive role internally, you're going through a 12-month transition program, internal program, uh, and the same same uh, would apply for external uh, talent. New leader assimilation and uh, comprehensive stakeholder analysis. So, I want to share uh, just a, uh, I'll share a few of those with the, the case in a moment here. Um, relatedly, role-based leadership development probably the trickiest for a lot of practical reasons. How do we put people in different roles that stretch them, that are in roles that are strategically aligned? that in fact uh, force a different level of, of learning. So we're, we're, we're kind of capturing that strategic insight, the ability to see the enterprise as a whole, um, in a way that doesn't disrupt the current business. Right? That's almost always the pressure point for, for business owners. So um, uh, and, uh, role based leadership development, I'll provide a few examples of that in, uh, in a moment here. So here's a case. Here's an organization that does this really well. Um, a Cleveland Clinic Health System, uh, you know, certainly a, a renowned um, healthcare provider, uh, an academic uh, a provider, 
Uh, fascinating story in terms of their development. If we had more time, I'd love to, to share a bit more. But uh, a little bit smaller. This is a little bit more closer to the uh, you know mid mid to large size, 43,000 FTEs uh, and about six uh, billion in uh, annual net patient revenue. So a little bit smaller than um, than the Sutter Health example. So here's what they do just for their executives. So this is where again the, the depth and the quality of thinking of executive transition into, into new roles or executive onboarding. Uh, book of knowledge, they're really very uh, academic and comprehensive to package uh, the, the data that a new executive would need coming in. So things like the strategic plan, operating principles, uh, uh, reporting relationships. Uh, those of you who know anything about uh, Cleveland Clinic and Mayo operates in much the same way. It's a very matrix uh, organization where it's run by institutes. It is uh, physician-led, and so the administrative roles are, are not just backed are mostly um, patient, are mostly uh, clinicians in, in that respect, and so that requires a, uh, you know, greater, greater effort in terms of that onboarding process. Stakeholder analysis and interviews, um, fairly traditional but exhaustive, and that is uh, not uncommon. In fact, uh, the work that we did with them, upwards of 20, 25 of these stakeholder interviews that took place over a six month period, some of whom were external partners. Right, uh, government employees, other better providers. So that's a, a very rigorous process. Uh, probably the most uh, interesting part is this new leader assimilation. And I suspect uh, a number of folks in the room uh, have done this work or maybe are continuing to. And that is being very deliberate about we transition our new, newly selected or promoted person to a new context. Let's introduce him or her to their team in a, in a formalized way, in a facilitated way that helps that, that team uh, essentially hit the ground running. And uh, they've had uh, tremendous results. I know this is always a resource and time issue. You know, can you do that to scale when you have a uh, massive growth period in this case? Uh, they do it particularly well. Uh, so there are a few things that they do uh, really, I think, tells the story. Number one, um, very, very, uh, uh, an incredibly strong partnership from the executive team. And that is, uh, in this case, the hiring executive really feels like they're driving the process in many ways, right? Uh, and that's, that is not to minimize our collective role, right, the work that, that we're all doing, but it's to, to, to acknowledge that, you know, for the CFO who's bringing in a revenue cycle management VP, um, that person has a sense of, you know, who are the right stakeholders that we need to engage, how might we think of a, a, an assimilation, assimilation process that's going to work, what's the history, uh, in that unit, you know, are there free relations given the last person? So it's a very, very, uh, a very strong partnership in this case. This alliance is, uh, as we're describing it, um, socialization to new role, rapid assimilation, opportunities for early wins. Um, you know, really important process. I know uh, many of you uh, likely involved in this space as well. You know, in the first six months, you know, what is that initial contribution? That's substantive. It's really a value that's going to provide, you know, nice, uh, nice transition for uh, for the newly placed executive. Okay, a couple of data points here. Uh, they also use a scorecard approach, but a couple that they found, and this is probably not too surprising from an academic setting, they do uh, a fair amount of kind of longitudinal uh, results. They looked over a period of four years, they said, well, let's compare those executives who did, did participate in our executive onboarding process to those who did not, and to what extent did they feel like they were you know, well supported. So this is a survey based, so this is the kind of self-report. Uh, but it's a sense, and this is uh, their annual employee engagement survey, it's a sense that those participants felt not just that they were more supportive, that they felt at home, but that their relationship with their immediate report to the hiring executive uh, was, was, was much stronger, much better than it, it can be expected, which um, for many of these folks in uh, very complex roles that are evolving was, was really important. So you see a lot of these, uh, these items here specifically, and I've, I've kind of captured these uh, 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 very deliberately. Leadership support, the person I report to provides good feedback. I like the work that I do. I feel supported. It's really the um, how do I how do I see uh, others supporting me in my in my transition. Um, similarly, on productivity, uh, they compared this over a three-year period. Um, how much more productive do our newly placed executives feel as a result of this program? This is after one year, and I think that the last data points really uh, uh, really tell me. Um, still discovering areas that I need to understand in this incredibly complex matrix environment of institutes that I'm trying to figure out where I fit. Uh, the new program in 2015 um, had a, a much lower sense of just about a third. Said, okay, I'm still, I'm still kind of in a learning period after one year. And that's it's really important in this, uh, this, uh, this context when it comes to first year turnover. 
Okay, um, so last part of my, uh, my talk, just wanted to provide um, some specific uh, recommendations, uh, practices, things that you may already be doing, looking to accelerate, or just some, some new ideas that, that and, you, know, you may have heard something that would, uh, would be useful moving, moving forward. Um, uh, and I know for a very uh, uh, in-tuned audience, as all of you are, you're likely asking, well, that's great. You heard from three organizations that are doing quite well. Um, what does that really say about the broader market or the, the broader set of organizations? How is this just, a, you know, is he cherry picking uh, organizations that are really doing well? Good question to ask, very, uh, very astute. Uh, the answer is, uh, and through, through the benchmarking work that we do, we have a, a good sense of what is the utilization rate of these best practices across the industry, not just healthcare, but across. And two, probably most importantly for your executive teams and boards, what, what evidence is there these capabilities actually predict or are associated with customer or consumer operational and financial metrics? Does it actually predict or is associated with performance? So the issue of utilization of these best practices and what they predict really, really are important. So here are, here are a few data points to consider. Um, again, this is a, a semi-annual survey that we do. We see the two lowest scores on utilization, so this is across industries, are uh, talent assessment and role-based development. And if you ask the question, these are chief, uh, chief HR officers, mostly CHROs, some VPs who are reporting how frequently does the organization engage in these practices. And uh, this is actually, you're actually the first to see the, see the, the 2018 cut of data, so uh, hope, uh, hope that's a, a good thing. Uh, the survey is still out, so we're, uh, we're capturing a few more responses. So what we see here, uh, based on the, the uh, scale, uh, a lot of organizations are doing uh, rarely or not at all uh, these role-based practices, right? Action, action uh, research, uh, action learning programs, uh, strategic assignments, job rotations, etc. Uh, talent assessment practices that rigor around using talent reviews, thinking of succession profiles. Those are two uh, two weak points. Uh, I should say less utilized points. If you dig a little bit deeper and say, well, uh, what specifically is 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 perhaps not yet being utilized and uh, again, this is a conversation I had a conversation with a few folks this morning before the session, uh, which was uh, kind of validating um, high potential employees being formally assessed at the front line. And so thinking of you know, how do we move the process to really where most of the action is with these millennials who are about or already and will continue to make that transition, uh, we see this is where uh, there's really uh, not much. Only 43% uh, report rarely or not at all assessing any kind of potential for that. Initial leadership roles, emergent leaders. Um, same for formal assessments. And this, this is really uh, also troubling. I know many of you certainly have, uh, you know, obviously come from a measurement, uh, kind of background, academic background. Um, you know, rely on perceptual measures of, of potential performance, categorical measures, carries a lot of risk. And, and uh, I'll speak to that just, uh, just a minute before we, before we finish. Okay, how about uh, metrics? So again, uh, is this just the Kaisers of the world, uh, just the Cleveland Clinic, or is there is there data that suggests these are predictive? These these capabilities are predictive. So here are a few data points to consider. Again, this is part of our our uh, semi-annual benchmarking work. Uh, we see if you look very specifically around um, who's doing this particularly well, the high utilizers. And I, I suspect there are a lot of organizations in the room who are in that category. Do do a lot of this work compared to uh, those who uh, do very little of it. So if you look across the model, across all. All seven of those. So we see uh, for high utilization versus low utilization, we see um, quite a bit of difference, a big delta around um, efficiency. Um, if you look at healthcare organizations, uh, Medicare spending per episode, uh, and, and that's kind of healthcare speak for how efficient are you with the dollars that the government provides you uh, to meet, meet service, to provide services during the Medicare episode, heart attack, stroke, or otherwise. Uh, we see uh, quite a difference here. That's, of course, uh, good news for. The governments, or at least for, for those who are looking to, to you know, uh, be, think differently about Medicare and its um, solvency. Um, patient satisfaction or customer satisfaction, really important, right? That's something that now providers are reimbursed for. So those surveys you complete after uh, hospital stay or otherwise uh, aren't just for internal purposes. Right? That's a part of what becomes reimbursable for organizations. We see a, another a big uh, jump between high, high utilizers of these competencies or capabilities and others, and then traditional uh, turnover data. Okay, 
Um, leadership bench strength, we talked about that, internal and external uh, placement rate. Um, these are, those are two metrics that I, I think are, are kind of cornerstone. And that's not to say if you're not tracking those, it's less important, but looking broadly, um, those two tell a really important story. Um, how reliant are you on outside talent, even during times of growth? And how prepared are you for the unexpected transition in, in roles, uh, health, uh, sickness, or otherwise? And so we see uh, really the remarkable jump there, 68% versus 21%, depending on, on utilization. So really encouraging. Of course, uh, I'll spend a lot more time in the book uh, kind of diving into the details. OK, uh, last few minutes here, recognitions for practice. I have six, six very quick or reasonably uh, concise uh, suggestions that if you say, all right, what are the primary takeaways from, from today's session? How can I use some of this content you know, for your work, for your organizations? Um, here, here are six I'd recommend. Number one, uh, this issue around strategic alignment, uh, we can't get away from, right? Uh, the, the work that we do around succession, thinking about those talent pools as we think of, of talent reviews, of high potential assessment, of internal leadership academies, of multi-source feedback systems, um, how, how sharply wedded are those tools and practices to the existing strategic plan of the firm, the strategic initiatives we're trying to execute, and how we support that. that, that that's, uh, I know uh, as HR professionals, uh, uh, you've been uh, working that to death uh, since inception, but it's just a reminder, it's really important. And so um, thinking about these practices in that light I think is really, really key. Uh, number two, enhancing engagement of board members and executive teams across these capabilities. Um, and I, I uh, fully acknowledge that some executive teams aren't there. Uh, they may not have the same set of values. They may not necessarily uh, want, you have to kind of lead them to water in many respects. That's why I think a, a data-driven argument is really uh, what, what seems to kind of tie us together, no matter where, uh, where you sit in the organization. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll provide a couple of specifics uh, in a moment here around uh, how that might, uh, might happen. Okay, uh, develop robust success metrics and ROI measures. Um, um, this, this tells a very powerful story. Um, you know, I've had a chance to be a part of these in different contexts, and that is making the case to the board, making the case to an executive team. Why should we do more of this, and what are we going to get from it? You know, what's, what's the outcome? Um, so a few ways to do that. Um, illustrating the uh, you know, kind of those internal uh, uh, analytics around retirement trajectories, around diversity, around where are we most vulnerable in key roles. You know, certainly tells an important picture. Um, issues around uh, the actual metrics. If you're not tracking those, how to begin tracking those? Internal external hiring ratio. Uh, how diverse is the pipeline? Particularly if diversity is a part of what, what your organization says it you know cares about. That's a part of the initiative. That should be a part of what the board is hearing twice a year relative to, to metrics. Um, and then benchmarking is, is one that I found uh, for many organizations, and that's the competitiveness of, uh, of our world, in some cases, can tell a really important story. So here's an example, and something we've, uh, we've worked with, uh, with clients in different contexts, is to go through a, a benchmarking analysis of, well, great, these sound like terrific capabilities, these are important practices. Uh, we'd love to know, it would be important for us internally to know, how well are we doing these? And, and how will we do these relative to our peers, those who are facing the same kind of industrial, uh, I should say competitive, uh, market-based demands that we are. Um, so in this case, it's, a, it's essentially an analysis, this talent development success management assessment um, allows you to basically kind of categorize what are we doing well relative to our peers, what are our development areas, and the, the kind of the common framework here is on criticality to our strategic plan, to the, the strategies we're trying to execute um, where, where are we at our best? So this kind of analysis, and this is a, an example from a, a, an organization we're working with around, and this happens to be a healthcare client, uh, examines uh, very specifically relative to the current strategic planning goals, where do we see our strengths, how can we le further leverage those, where are development areas, and this starts a, I think, a really useful conversation with the executive team and then ultimately the board on, you know, why should this be a priority for us? And this might be work you're already doing, which is terrific. Uh, this, this allows, I think, a really powerful benchmarking conversation to happen relative to, uh, to competitors. Okay, uh, assess count review for frequency, rig uh, duration, and rigor. Uh, you've likely heard this before, but so it, this is more of a reminder. Uh, really, such an important, critical process. And if you're serious about succession planning around uh, high potential assessment and development and how to use those data points, um, this cannot be done uh, in a, you know, three-hour session once a year. Um, 
given the complexity and size of, of the organizations, as I understand that we're uh, where you all embedded. So um, duration becomes, you know, how, how frequently are you having these conversations? Is it a facilitated uh, session? Um, to what extent are multiple levels engaged in the process? Or is it just for the executive team? Um, to what extent are formalized tools used to get away from managerial judgment and executive judgment? I know uh, that's uh, sometimes a tough topic to, uh, to broach with, coll with colleagues and clients and uh, executive team members, but uh, there are better ways to assess for potential and performance and role than, you know, kind of, a, you know, an informal conversation. Um, so, to that end, a couple recommendations here on a formal, multi-dimensional uh, assessment process. And I'm just, I'd be love to learn from the group about how many folks are, are, are using a formal, validated measure of, of potential. Just, just by a show of hands. Is anyone using a tool that, uh, when I say validate, it's gone through kind of the, the rigors of development and prediction. Looks like a couple, couple of folks. Great. Okay. Just want to verify that uh, to get some a sense of uh, kind of uh, uh, our collective experiences. Um, this can again be uh, kind of an ask of, of the executive team to say, you know, we're looking to improve prediction, improve accuracy, improve developmental implications, and reduce legal exposure by having a formalized tool. Uh, I don't mean to uh, hit that over the head too much, but uh, there is real risk. You know, I, I've uh, participated in a, um, uh, a discrimination uh, lawsuit as a subject matter expert, you know, as part of uh, a review. I can tell you, and I suspect that you likely have as well, um, that's a real issue. Um, to what extent, in the case of wrongful termination, in the case of uh, something that doesn't go particularly well internally, um, what is the rigor and depth of how we have continually assessed assessment? Oh, I can hear my... Uh, those are going off. All right, I'll, uh, I'll transition. So here's one to consider. Uh, we've got uh, uh, this leadership readiness, pardon me, leadership readiness assessment. So this is one, one tool, there are certainly others out there, but one we found a lot of success with, and it essentially uh, provides a, a rigorous way to think of if our goal is to understand potential for executive potential, leadership potential, and one that can be used for targeting developmental implications, what are the competencies factors we should be examining? How do we assess it, and how do we how do we make that a part of our of our uh, ongoing process? And so again, a lot of them out there. We found a lot of success here. Emily Latitude, people savvy, learning agility, and this uh, this issue around leadership capability. Um, and uh, again, it's great being in a, in a room with other professionals who have the same uh, likely same experiences. But this is a tough one, right? The subject matter expert, the skilled technology lead, the skilled clinician, the skilled engineer. Um, very often is, is, is either not the person who should be in a leadership role or has absolutely no interest. And you know, we, we often, by way of uh, convenience, in some cases stability, right, of a business unit, we you know, ask that person to step in, into that role. So measures like these are, are, are meant to be really clear about how to understand that in a rigorous way. So things like the drive to lead, uh, willingness and, and yearning for a, a position, being in a position of influence, getting away from the, the operations of the work becomes you know, an important uh, predictor. So uh, again, uh, not to be a uh, dead horse, but this formal review I think is really, really important. All right, last but not least, uh, leadership development culture. Um, this kind of uh, brings us full circle. You know, if our goal is to have a, a broad view, a diverse view of where leaders come from in the organization, you know, having multiple uh, internal leadership academy program and other efforts that is not just for you know uh, future executive team leaders becomes really important. Uh, that that sends a very powerful message to uh, uh, to the workforce overall. So a few suggestions here. You know, thinking about aligning internal leadership programs with uh, specific career paths. Uh, again, kind of back to the healthcare example. A uh, number of the organizations we work with are very clear uh, for nurse leaders who are aspiring to ascend into very prominent roles. Uh, if you've, you've been in a healthcare context, there's no more complex or important role than your chief nursing officer and what he or she is asked to do. Uh, exceedingly difficult. So therefore, thinking about a, a, a career path and a program to support that career path for nurse leaders becomes really, really critical, uh, much as it is for, for technology and other, other spaces. And I know uh, a number of folks in the room have, uh, I, I suspect, have a similar, a similar challenge. Okay, last but not least, I do thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, it looks like I've gone over a couple of minutes per usual, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I did share uh, some of the, the data from uh, from the book. You'll see 
uh, is, is a part of the, the, the analysis, but there's certainly other, other examples and uh, 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 data points you might find interesting. Um, I, I do want to close just by saying it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure, frankly, to uh, go through a book project that is not directed at uh, academic uh, uh, editors or peer-reviewed journals. There's nothing wrong with those folks, right? Uh, you can't earn tenure and keep your job unless you do so. That's, that's all fair. Uh, but it's, it's a very different audience. So what, uh, what you'll see, uh, those who are interested, you know, this book is really written for HR, OD, learning professionals, folks like you, um, executive teams, boards, those who are in the business of saying, how are we going to, if we care about succession, we care about managing leadership talent, you know, how do we actually put these things into practice? So uh, not a lot of academies, uh, a lot of sourcing, so a lot of, lot of other materials that uh, I'm happy to share otherwise. But uh, and this, uh, this book, has, uh, maybe I should uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, um, uh, my, uh, acknowledge Pepperdine, the business school. They, um, again, have a real value in applied research. So, you know, if I were at a different uh, school, a different business school, you know, a project like this may be uh, not, not as possible. So the, the, the value. So, again, pleasure to wear both hats. And uh, I do thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll have to transition. Oh, we, we, I'm excited, rather, to transition to uh, the panel session. I would say if you have questions about any of the content in today's session, uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to have a conversation. I'd love to learn from you and some of the challenges that you're, uh, that you're facing. Um, and I know we have, um, as I understand it, a, uh, a number of opportunities uh, you know, as a part of the rest of the program to, uh, to touch base. So uh, thank you again for your, uh, your attention. Look forward to the rest of the, the program today.